All right. So in our last class period, we started to talk about um, the big maritime empires. And the four empires that have the most in common are going to be the Dutch, the Portuguese, the British, and the French, because they're all in the Indian Ocean. They all have trade post empires. They all are in Africa. They're all trading slaves. But in many ways, the most important one is the Spanish. And the Spanish is different for a couple of reasons. And the biggest reason being that they're going to actually control the most land in this time period because they're going to conquer the Americas. Now, when Columbus discovered the Americas, there were big, strong, powerful Native American empires. And again, I should use the term Amer Indian empires in this region. There was the Aztecs, there were the Incas, two big empires, one in Mexico, one in South America. The Spanish were able to destroy these empires and take over these empires and conquer the Americas very, 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 very quickly because they have some advantages that Native American groups don't have. Guns, steel, and horses are all things that Europeans have that Native American groups did not have these technologies or these animals. There's not a single horse in the Americas before the Spanish bring them in their conquest of the Americas. But in many ways, the thing that's going to help the Spanish the most in their conquest of the Americas is the diseases they carry, specifically smallpox. Native Americans did not carry the immunities to smallpox that the Spanish and later on other European and African groups bring to the Americas. And one of the great tragedies that's associated with the discovery of the Americas is approximately 95% of the Amer Indian population in all the Americas gets wiped out by a disease epidemic. And we're gonna talk more about this disease epidemic going forward. But with their advantages in guns, germs, steel, and horses, and remember those things, the Spanish conquer basically all of North and South America, with a couple of exceptions, extremely quickly. And one of the things that we're going to associate that the Spanish are going to introduce to the Americas is a color-based hierarchy, which we still deal with in the Americas even to this day. But we need to understand that this is the empire that's the most different. If we go back to our to our other empires that we looked up the previous at the other days, this is what the Spanish Empire will look like. Big, powerful, lots and lots and lots of territory in the Americas and the Philippines versus what these other empires look like. This is the Dutch trade posts. This is the British territory in the Americas, but mostly trade posts in India and Africa. And this is what the French looks like. Again, trade posts in the Indian Ocean in Africa and a little bit of land in the Americas. We've already talked about the Portuguese empire in a lot of depth. So what we have are these five empires, these five maritime empires, and we've never seen maritime empires before. We've never seen groups of people control territories overseas. And we talked about how these maritime empires are going to be able to do that. Well, what you're gonna see for the first time as a result of these maritime empires that are a byproduct of European voyages of exploration is the first truly global exchange that's ever taken place. Before this, we had seen interregional exchanges, East Asia to the Muslim world or to South Asia, North Africa to West Africa, the Middle East to East Africa. But what we had never seen is truly global interactions involving the entire world. And that's the biggest change that takes place. During this time period, we have a term for these new goods and things that get exchanged globally for the first time in the post-Columbus world. And we call this exchange the Columbian Exchange. The Columbian Exchange is the exchange of food, people, disease, plants, and religions that takes place between Europe, Africa, the Americas, and Asia in the post-Columbus world. I, I would argue that this is probably 
the most impactful thing that we'll actually look at in this class all year. Things that happen in the post-Columbus world are going to shape the modern world so dramatically and in so many different impactful ways. And so many things that we benefit from and struggle with today are a byproduct of the Colombian exchange. So you really need to know the term. Now, this is just um, some of the things that get exchanged. And I want you just to see, have a visual representation of the regions that are involved in these interactions. But what we really need to talk about is what's being exchanged and how is it being exchanged. First thing we want to talk about is disease transfers. Diseases are going to transfer both ways. There's going to be diseases that Native Americans carry that they're immune to, that they're going to give Africans and Europeans and vice versa. And the worst disease epidemic is what we talked about earlier. Europeans and later the African slaves they bring with them to the Americas carry smallpox, but they also carry immunities to smallpox. So you, you know, you carry the immunities to diseases that your ancestors gave you. And Europeans and Africans, while they were carriers of things like smallpox, they were immune to the effects. Native Americans did not have these immunities. They also bring over with them measles and malaria. And it's not just people who are bringing these diseases over from Africa in Europe to the Americas. It's also vermin like rats that stow away on ships and mosquitoes. This is gonna devastate Native American populations and it's gonna result in the death of approximately 95% of the Amerindian population in the Americas. It's horrifying. We're talking about millions and millions and millions of people dying of this, of this disease epidemic. And it's one of the great tragedies in world history. Now, while Europeans and Africans bring diseases to the Americas, Native Americans, Amerindians, give Europeans diseases that Europe will bring back to Europe that will wreck European society. And the biggest one in that one, a disease is syphilis. Now, syphilis does have a very negative impact on Europe, but not to the same extent. First of all, syphilis isn't automatically a death sentence, it's an, and it's an STD. You can play defense against syphilis. There's a way not to get syphilis. Don't sleep with somebody who has syphilis. As opposed to what you see in the Americas, where smallpox and measles, these are airborne diseases. There's no way that you can prevent getting exposed to them if you come into contact with a person that has them. So there is a two-way disease transfer. And it's very important that you know what's coming from where and where is it going when we look at these things. New trade goods. This is extremely important. We're going to talk a lot about this because new trade goods are going to be exchanged and they're still luxury goods. Global exchange of goods, long distance. We've said a, something that we've talked about very consistently in this class is luxury goods, the types of goods that are going to be exchanged very, very long distances. And that's going to continue. From the Americas, the Spanish find a literal mountain made out of silver in Peru. It's called Mount Pelosi. It's the largest silver deposit in world history. It is the mother load. They also find silver in Mexico. The Spanish are gonna mine this silver. We're gonna talk about how they mine that silver in future class periods. And they're gonna export it globally. The number one place they're going to export silver to is they're not gonna bring it back to Europe. What they're going to do is they're going to take the silver they mine in Peru and they're going to trade it in the Philippines to Chinese merchants. China during this time period, and we will talk about this Chinese dynasty in a lot of depth later on, is ruled by a Chinese dynasty called the Ming. The Ming are the ones that drive the Mongol Yuan dynasty out of power and they set up a traditional Chinese dynasty. But one of the things they're trying to do is limit interactions with foreigners. Well, in order to trade with them, the Spanish colonized the Philippines. And I had talked about that a couple of videos ago. And what would happen is the Spanish would trade their very valuable silver to the Ming through the Philippines. And in return for their silver, they would get even more valuable Asian luxury goods 
like silk, which was still the highest quality silk in the world at this time, like porcelain. And then they would take those back through the Americas and then all the way back to Europe and sell it in European markets at an enormous profit. So the Spanish aren't mining silver and bringing it back to Europe. They're mining silver, trading it for even more valuable Asian luxury goods. And then they're taking those luxury goods back to Europe and selling them for just an enormous profit. Um, you're going to see groups of people in the Americas grow sugar. The first group to do this are going to be the Portuguese in Brazil. And this is going to introduce the tragedy of the transatlantic slave trade. Sugar is a highly, highly sought after good. It can be sold at very large profit in European markets. But the problem with sugar is it is miserable to grow. The Portuguese, Portuguese wanted to grow sugar, but the Portuguese didn't want to grow the sugar. Well, taking advantage of trade contacts they had made with African tribes, they start to purchase slaves from African tribes and bring them to the Americas to grow sugar on plantations. And I want you to get this big picture idea because this is gonna come up later. 95% of the Africans who were ever captured in the and sold into slavery are captured and sold into slavery by another African, two Europeans who then bring them over to the Americas. We're gonna talk about the impact of that on African societies and what that does to them later on. But this is gonna be the introduction of the transatlantic slave trade. And one of the things you might be very surprised about is most of the slaves that come across the Atlantic from, from Africa do not end up in the 13 colonies. Somewhere between 90 and 95% of the slaves that come across the ocean do not go to the Americas. They go to Brazil or they go to one of the islands in the Caribbean that's growing sugar. The Spanish, the English, the French, and the Dutch eventually will all control islands and they will all grow sugar on those islands and they will all use African slaves on plantations. And it's one of the truly horrible, horrible labor systems in world history. And also, you'll see the British export tobacco from the 13 colonies. Just like the way you grow sugar using slaves on plantations, the British will, will purchase slaves and grow, grow tobacco using um, in what, is, what was formerly known as the 13 colonies. Now, Believe it or not, everything we know about American slavery, which is completely disgusting and completely awful and completely miserable, if you had your choice between being an American slave or a slave on a sugar plantation in the Caribbean or in Brazil, you actually would have probably chosen being a tobacco slave in the 13 colonies, which is not to paint that out to be some sort of Shangri-La, but the thing about the 13 colonies is they're far enough north that work in the 13 colonies was seasonal. You actually did have some semblance of some sort of break versus sugar was year round. And sugar is much more physical and much more demanding in much hotter temperatures. And you don't really have the seasons because of how close they are to the equator. The average life expectancy of a slave getting off the ship to go work in a sugar plantation was about 14 months. They would work those poor people to death and they wouldn't take care of them because it was just cheaper to buy a new slave than it was to take care of the slaves you had in Brazil and in the Caribbean. And that's why most of the slaves get, that come across the Atlantic end up in those places. But know that most of the slaves who come over to the New World, they're going to end up on a sugar plantation in Brazil or in an island in the Caribbean, not necessarily in the 13 colonies. By the way, while we're here talking about this, how do you know an island in the Caribbean, once upon a time, was an English sugar growing island? And the answer is this, most of the people who live on that island speak English and they're African. There's only one reason you have Africans who know English on an island in the Caribbean, like Jamaica. And that's because originally Jamaica was used as a British sugar growing island and they imported African slaves and that's how they got there. Same for the Bahamas. How do you know 
that, if, if, that an island was was a French sugar growing island in the Caribbean. Well, the people there speak French, like in Haiti, and they're overwhelming African in their ancestry. That's how you know. Now, while uh, slaves are going to come to uh, slaves are going to come to America. I should say, excuse me, while sugar is exported from America and tobacco is exported from America and silver is exported from America and to, uh, I think I said tobacco already is exported from America, there are going to be things that are going to be exported from Europe and Africa to the Americas. The, for the big one is slaves. And I hate to, we hate to use this term to say, talk about slaves being a trade good or a luxury good. Just understand that's how they were seen at the time. And then again, this is one of the great tragedies of the slave system is that they're reduced to being some sort of economic good. And that's gonna have some lots of long-term issues that we're gonna talk about. Other goods that are gonna come from Europe to the Americas are manufactured goods, things that are made, things, guns, things made out of metal, textiles, finished products, you, what would normally happen in the trade is some sort of is the raw goods would come out of the Americas and then the finished goods would come back. From Europe to Africa, guns. European groups would, would arm certain African tribes who they're allied with so that those African tribes could go and capture more slaves to sell them. Textiles, metal goods. And then from Asia to, Af to Europe, we talked about how the Spanish are going to take their precious luxury goods. China and I mean, how the Spanish are going to take their silver, excuse me, take it to the Philippines and trade it to the um, the Ming for their silk and their porcelain and bring that back to Europe. So all of these regions are going to be interconnected, but it's very important to know what is coming out of each of these regions at this time. Just to show you this again, the emphasis on what we're talking about today is that these interactions are global. We've never seen global interactions like this before. It's very, very, very important that you understand that concept. Now, the next big thing that we want to talk about is new staple crops and animals that get exchanged. Now, a staple crop is a crop that one group of people grew, and it's the number one food item they grew for themselves. And what's going to happen is sometimes in these exchanges, Someone will bring back a food from one of these places overseas to their homeland, plant it, find out that it grows really well in their homeland, and 100 years later, that place is covered with it. The Americans have lots of foods that are going to spread globally. Number one is potatoes. We talked in their previous class period about why potatoes are awesome. They are easy to grow. They make a lot of food. They make a lot of calories. They're incredibly nutritious. And it doesn't require a lot of great soil and work and water. You're going to see potatoes spread globally. And they're going to be synonymous with certain groups of people, like the Irish. Someone brings a potato back to Ireland, plants it to see if it grows well there, and by gosh, it does. And 100 years later, the whole island is covered in potatoes. This is going to be extremely impactful in places like this. Russia is going to be covered in potatoes. India is going to be covered in potatoes. I love food from South Asia, and I love curries. And one of the most common types of curries is potato curries. And you don't have that in South Asia until after the Colombian Exchange. Corn or maize, which was indigenous to the Americas, is going to spread globally. My ancestry is Italian. All of northern Italy, the national dish of that region is polenta. Well, what is polenta? Polenta is basically grits, Italian-style grits. And what does grits come from? It comes from corn. So, again, these are foods that are going to spread globally. Peppers. Hot, spicy peppers are only indigenous to America. We think of my favorite restaurant in this town, in town is Chili Thai. Thai food in you know region of Asia is famous for hot, hot, spicy food. Nobody ever had hot, spicy food in Thailand until the Colombian Exchange, until peppers that came from America spread globally. One food that you may never have heard of, which is going to have a huge impact on the world, is manioc. 
Manioc is a native root vegetable in the Americas that's going to make its way to Africa. And in Africa, even to this day, tens and tens and tens of millions of people in Africa eat manioc as a staple food of their diet every day of their lives. And also tomatoes. There's going to be food that comes from Africa to the Americas. Slaves are going to bring with them rice and okra and bananas. Bananas are not indigenous to the Americas. They are brought by African slaves across the Atlantic to the Americas. From Europe to them to Americas, citrus trees. Citrus is not indigenous to the Americas. Peach trees, apple trees, all these types of fruit trees are not indigenous to this region. And also they're going to introduce large domesticated animals to the Americas. The Americas do not have any of these animals, horses, pigs, chicken, and cattle. The introduction of these animals are going to provide be be beasts of labor, but also important staple food products in the diets of people in the Americas. And this food exchange is going to have a tremendous impact on global groups. The number one thing that happens as a result of new food interactions is this. Global populations will surge. Tomorrow I'm going to show you a chart of global populations. And you're going to see that in this time period, the population of the world explodes. And that is primarily as a, as a result of the arrival of new, healthier foods. Anytime there's new food and more food, you're going to see a population surge. And this is the most unprecedented food exchange the world has ever seen up to this time. Now, even in places like Africa, if, you, if I had said to you, hey, what do you think happens to African population before this period or during this period? You would probably say to yourself, well, there's lots of wars between tribes trying to get, to, get slaves where lots of people die. And then millions of slaves are going to be sold off the continent. So what probably happens to African populations is the population of Africa goes down. Actually, it doesn't. That's how powerful new food is. As a result of the introduction of new foods like manioc into Africa, despite all the people who die in the wars against slaves, despite the tens of millions of people sold across the ocean into slavery, the population of Africa still increases. That's how powerful food is on population demographics. A place like Ireland that didn't have the negative demographic effect but had the benefit of new foods like potatoes, their population just explodes. Same for China. One of the things that people don't know about China is this. You know that China in the world today is the second leading producer of corn globally? There are millions of people in China who eat corn every day. And that's a byproduct of the Columbia Exchange. Japan is covered in sweet potatoes. Nobody in Japan ever had a sweet potato before the Columbia Exchange. So these new, pot, new food foods introduced to these new places are going to result in massive population explosion. For the first time, you're going to see global religion. In period one, the most widespread religion in the world was Islam. It had spread over trade routes, but it was interregional. You didn't see Islam come to the Americas because no one had discovered the Americas. First, truly global religion in this time period is going to be Christianity because all these European groups are Christian. English, Spanish, Portuguese, Dutch, and French will spread their religion and their language globally. You know, you think about a place like Mexico. What's the national language of Mexico? Spanish. What's the national religion? Catholicism. Why are they Catholic? Because Spain was Catholic and they forced their religion. <laughs> Protestant and Catholic beliefs will spread to colonies all over the world. Like, I don't really, if you say, hey, I don't really know what Protestant beliefs are. For right now, just know that they're a separate set of Christian beliefs, and later on we'll get into what happened that caused this breakup between Protestants and Catholic Christians. But hey, the 13 colonies, why do they speak English? Why are they Protestant? Because they were a British colony. African languages and their native religious beliefs will spread to the Americas. The slaves that come over to the Americas, 
they are going to bring their language, their culture, and their belief systems to the Americas. So while the big spread of, of religion and language is European, you also see the introduction of African languages to the Americas for the first time. And we're going to talk more about some unique African religious beliefs in the Americas going forward. But for right now, you just need to know that these exchanges are taking place globally and who is driving all these food and disease and luxury good and exchange of peoples and religions and languages. It's Europeans. And that's the big change from this period, in this period from the previous period. Why did Europe go from insignificant in period one to so significant? And this answer is simple. They discovered the Americas. They discovered these new global trade routes. And now all of a sudden they have so much more resources than everyone else that they're going to begin to exploit them. One other thing I'd like to say about these groups of people, maritime empires in this time period do not have all the same traits as the land-based trade routes that we talked about. One of the things that these groups of people are not going to do is practice religious tolerance. And they're also not going to incorporate native groups of people into their governments. Why is that? How come all the land-based empires had to do these things in order to survive? But these European groups that have territories all over the world don't. And the answer to that question is because of how big of a technological advantage they have. They have guns. They have steel, they have beasts like horses, and native groups that they've conquered don't. So they're not afraid of rebellion. And you only are inclusive when you're afraid of the groups of people you've conquered having the ability to rise up and overthrow you. They don't feel like the groups of people they've conquered have that ability, so they're not afraid of them. So they're going to treat the people they've conquered in these empires very, very differently than what we saw in the land-based empires of period one. So that's going to do it for today. We're going to keep talking about the impact of these European empires globally in our next lessons. And um, stay on the Zoom and I will give you guys the big, the, the work for the day. So see you guys.